Secretary Gates, I, I also want to thank you for being here, especially in light of the fact that you've recently had an injury. I know you're making a robust recovery, but having to wear a neck brace has surely complicated your, your being here and, and getting here, and we thank you for, for making that effort. When I, <clears throat> until I became Secretary of Defense, I had never broken a bone or had a surgery. February of 2008, I fell on the ice and broke this shoulder in three places. And ten months later, putting a snowplow blade on a tractor, I pulled a bicep tendon off this arm. My security guards quickly came to the conclusion that Al Qaeda was no risk to me at all compared to myself. <laughs> and before we start, I'd like to say it is good to be back here at the center and to apologize to the audience on my right. Uh, for not turning in your direction, but the, uh, the result of a broken neck is somewhat limited mobility of my head. Well, um, let, let's, uh, that, that being said, let's get to your, your book, uh, 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 Duty, uh, Memoirs of the Secretary at War. I found it a most striking, striking account of your time under both uh, President Bush and President Obama, not the least because it gave what I would call an almost real-time account of your interchanges with President Obama and, uh, and the um, uh, former Secretary of State, uh, Hillary Clinton as you uh, and, and other very top members of the, uh, the, the nation's security establishment, as you wrestled with the difficulties uh, on the ground in Afghanistan. And I'd like to talk to you uh, at some length about your impressions of President Obama. But before we get into that, um, I wanted to focus on a part of the book that hasn't gotten that much attention, but which I think is equally important. And that's your description of the situation uh, in the government, in the White House, when you took over as Secretary of Defense in 2000, December of 2006. You describe a dire situation in, in Iraq. Uh, American troops are dying at increasing rates. Uh, uh, the ins insurgents are gathering force. There's extreme explosive sectarian violence and no apparent um, plan on the part of the United States government for, for coping with that. The takeaway from that part of the book is that we hadn't planned properly for the, for the occupation, and that, uh, that indeed it never occurred to military planners that we might be there as long as we had. Why were we so mistaken on that point? Why did we miss, miss that? One of the concluding sections of the book is, uh, in effect, on lessons learned about war. And, and one of the things that <clears throat> you'd think people would understand would be how frequently people who advocate going to war and people who make decisions to go to war almost always are convinced the war will be short. This year we'll celebrate the centenary of World War I, which is a classic example of where everybody thought the war would be over by October or November 1914. The problem in Iraq in particular, and, and it really is true of both Iraq and Afghanistan, that what began as swift military victories quickly degenerated into long and grinding wars. In the case of Iraq, uh, there, it was always believed that it would be a short-term commitment. I think it, it would be interesting to ask those who were participants in the decision-making, had they known in March 2003 that the country would be at war in Iraq for six or seven more years, whether they would have made the decision they did. But this, this assumption that the war would be short or that its end was right around the corner uh, afflicted the Department of Defense as badly as it did uh, the decision makers themselves. And because everyone assumed that the war uh, would be over quickly, there was a great reluctance inside defense to spend significant sums of money on equipment that might be needed to protect the troops, but that might be useful only in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, as I describe it in the book, the Department of Defense is organized to plan for war, 
not to wage war. And so the services dedicate all of their efforts, pretty much all of their efforts, to developing their long-range procurement plans and then defending those plans in the budget process regardless of what comes along. And so, and so people were reluctant to, for example, fund, uh, develop and fund the mine-resistant ambush protected vehicles that save so many lives and limbs because that, that particular kind of vehicle was not in any plan for the Army or the Marine Corps for I'd the long term. I'd like term. to ask you about that in, in just a moment. I, um, one of the, the key themes in that portion of the book, it seems to me, is that, um, that the military planners um, inside the Beltway, civilian leaders inside the Beltway, simply didn't, re didn't uh, adjust or respond to. And in fact, you do right, they did not adjust to, to changing situations. Um, on well, the, on and the I, ground and in Iraq. That, the fact that I, I also write that after the initial invasion, there was just a series of stunningly bad decisions and mistakes. Well, I'd like to read, uh, read a portion of the book, a, a situation that came across to me as, as a scandalous. And I say this also because you heap quite a bit of praise on President Bush uh, in this. And, you, you, uh, so I, I, and I think your critique of the president and the much-reported critiques of, of President Obama uh, have missed the point in that they're part of a larger fabric and evaluation of both of these men, which is much more nuanced than we've gotten so far. But let me read this one portion, which describes what I think is a, is a scandalous situation. Our our fundamentally flawed and persistent assumption from the outset that the Iraq war would be a short one caused many problems on the ground and for the troops. As the months stretched into years, those at senior levels nevertheless clung to their original assumption and seemed, to, seemed unwilling to invest substantial dollars to provide the troops everything they needed for protection and for success in their mission and to bring them home safely and if wounded to provide them with their ver the very best care. Who wanted to spend precious dollars on equipment for today's, uh, for today's troops that after Iraq would, be, uh, would, would just be surplus? So for years in Iraq, our troops traveled in light vehicles like Humvees, the modern equivalent of a Jeep, that even with armoring were vulnerable to, to weapons such as improvised explosive devices, rocket-propelled rocket -propelled gr grenades, and explosively formed projectiles. Were people asleep at the switch? Why did they not respond to uh, casualties were increasing? Um, the, what we were doing in Iraq was, was not working. Were they not visiting the country enough? Were they getting bad information? Why was there such bureaucratic resistance to making change? Well, I think, I think as I indicated earlier, I, for, I think they kept thinking that um, the, the end of the war was right around the corner. Throughout 2006, the commander in the field until, until the fall of 2006, our commander in Baghdad was still planning to draw down uh, uh, from 15 to 10 brigades by the end of 2006 and only realized toward the end of 2006 that wouldn't be possible. Actually, the first person, I think, seriously to conclude that the strategy wasn't working was President Bush. Uh, and I think that happened probably in the late spring or uh, summer of 2006. There were several different reviews launched of our strategy, including uh, the most important one was probably led by the National Security Council staff, which, which then led to the President's decision uh, to surge troops to get control of the security situation, particularly in Baghdad. This is a case, and I pointed out, you know, it's been presented mostly in a negative light, but I don't think it's a negative consideration that both Bush and Obama pushed back against the generals. Uh, in the case of Iraq in 2006, it was the civilian leadership that decided the strategy wasn't working, not the military. And when Bush decided to support the, Af the Iraq surge, he was opposed by the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the theater commander, the, the commander in Baghdad, and the commander of Central Command uh, in, in Florida. But I, but I must ask you, though, I mean, it, you can hardly characterize that as a brilliant insight. The entire country seemingly had turned against the war because we were not doing well there. Why did the generals come, why were they so late when everybody else had decided this was not